Madam Speaker, panelists, honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. My name is Josiah Tokoni and I'm also a youth worker in Fiji, part of so many youth groups and also part of the Sotalpa Youth. So my question is actually to the Honorable Minister for Tourism. I got two questions actually. No, only one question. Only one question. Okay, then I'll ask the second question, which is on the working population. Mr. O'Reilly said that uh, tourism is the major contributor to the working poor population in Fiji. So would the government consider at looking at regulating the increase of wages for tourism workers or might as well reconsider one of the petitions that was killed in Parliament last year, which is on the service for tourism worker, Vinaka. Thank you uh, for your question. I know exactly where that question comes from. Um, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I think you have to put it into perspective. And I, I'm, I'm free to say this here, actually. There's, there's nothing stopping me from saying this. If there is a particular tax that is put in place for only specific tourism workers, and I, I, I wish you would revisit your question one day when it comes back into Parliament. What about the other workers in the country? What about those workers that are carpenters who work in the tourism? Why do we have to have a specific tax just for tourism workers? There are other workers in the country. As far as the government is concerned, if there is a tax to be levied, it will be towards our sustainable goals, like the environment, etc. but a specific tax just for tourism workers? No. Thank you. My name is uh, Satish Narayan. I'm from the Fiji National University. Uh, my question goes to the Minister for Tourism. So, as you know, that uh, Suva has been declared as this destination, and we have uh, cruise liners coming almost every week. And uh, every time we see around Suva, it's uh, uh, full of tourists. But uh, I think that our cities are not conducive to tourism. Uh, they travel at their own risk. There are so many defective uh, uh, crossing lights, and it amounts to day walking. And also, if you walk around the footpaths, Suva, there's so many cracks that can amount to injury. And also, uh, quite uh, shockingly, is that uh, we have very few public convenience. Call of nature is. Uh, uh, charge 20 cents and given certain roll of paper depending on your body size. I think uh, that is not very conducive and probably the word of mouth is the best referrals, people going back to their country and this kind of negativity probably might uh, not be very Thank you. Conducive. Did you ask a question? Yes. We are currently at work uh, at the ministry together with other stakeholders including the city councils and, uh, and different stakeholders with respect to turning uh, what is called destination SUVA. And that means that we are in conjunction with the ports authorities, uh, local operators, and uh, different parts of SUVA that, are, that have historical destinations. We're, at, we're doing some work uh, with respect to the theme destination SUVA to correct what needs to be done. It's not an overnight fix, but I can assure you, sir, that all of those things are being looked at at the moment. But as I say, it has to be done properly. It's not a, a band-aid job. My question is directed to the minister. As a landowner, lands have been leased since the beginning of tourism industry. Can there be a policy made instead of leasing land? Can that be part of partnership? between landowners and hoteliers or whichever comes to build, instead of making decrease now, which is uh, making landowners not to do some of the activities, business activities within their own land. Thank you. So um, in terms of land ownership, and it's not necessarily just applicable to um, the resource owners and, and native landowners, Anybody who owns land is free to enter into a venture with anybody with respect to the tourism industry. It's not, it's not just uh, specifically to do with the tourism industry. If you wish to use your land and do it in terms of a joint venture with somebody, you are completely free to do so. There is no restriction on it, and it doesn't require a specific policy 
uh, with respect to that or any change in the law because there is no law against you entering into a joint venture with any company that wishes to do uh, uh, use the land for it. My name is uh, Lionel Danford. I'm uh, to operate in Nabu River. Uh, just a question uh, from the minister. It's been uh, the last three or four years now. The Nabu River has been um, excavation. Ex the excavation of gravel is too much, and uh, the legal operators, people without licenses, and uh, they're using TLTB license. We're supposed to be used on land, yet these big companies are using. On that, those licenses and government is allowing this. At last, the minister, please stop this madness. We another six months we'll stop operating. You should come and see the the, the Nabo River. You should take a ride trip with us and see the, the damage that this excavation has been going on. Please stop this madness. Thank you. My name is Humphrey Chang, a private sector and a tourist lover. But as a tourist lover, I think I need to say something which uh, <clears throat> this country needs badly. And that is, every tourist that comes to Fiji, they want to try something new. And something that they don't probably have not experienced in their own country. And I'm referring to the use of quick bikes, uh, rental bikes. Some of these are already in place. But there is a problem. And this... Uh, the question is going to be directed to the Hotel and Tourism Association as well as the Minister. That is, why is it so difficult to import quick bikes? Recently we had a case where someone imported a quick bike and it was confiscated because <coughs> it was not uh, brought in by uh, a dealer, so to speak. But why should that be? Thank you. Anybody else bring a, a quad bike in? Um, Mr. Chang, I know that there are some resorts that have quad bikes, so I know they are coming in. I'm not sure why you went. I don't know your circumstances. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I'm not sure if he said quick bike or quad bike. Quad bike. So I, in terms of dealer licenses, if you are going to venture into a... a that particular thing, you, uh, you have to bring it in, you have to have a dealer's license to import, whether it's a vehicle or a quad bike or etc. If you do bring it on, you can bring it in of your own accord, it's just follow the rules to do it. There isn't a major restriction on bringing those things in. If it, it's for, and as the um, Fantasia actually points out, there are operators who have quad bikes in, in the West. Um, there's nothing stopping you, but if you wish to specifically address a particular person's concern, please see me afterwards and I can help them. Good evening everyone, my name is Melody Simbala, I'm a USP student and active in the tourism industry. Uh, before my time runs out, I, my question is, why isn't government providing incentives for cruising to isolated maritime destinations, considering that cruising is one of the most common ways of getting around um, around the isolated maritime islands and government gives billions of dollars, millions of dollars to Fiji Airways and other other sectors but then cruising does not receive any incentives. So my question is why? Look, it's a good question. But the point is if we do a targeted assistance to only the, um, the cruise industry as you would say there are others, other areas of the industry that will step up and say, well, what about us? Government doesn't directly get involved and does, uh, does, government does not have a stake in cruising to the outer islands. It's the private companies that are involved that get all the other incentives that all the other operators do get. You're actually referring again to something similar to a specific tax. It's a specific tourist, uh, tourism assistance that's given to the cruise industry that involves the outer islands which really involves the private sector companies. So indirectly, they do get it through the other avenues, from whatever taxes, etc., that happen for, for the big operators that do the outer islands. But, you know, it's food for thought. I'm not saying no, I'm just saying it, it's, currently it's not something that the kind of targeted assistance is not there. 
you must remember also um, a lot of things that, that are done by government are done in a sustainable fashion. And when I say in a sustainable fashion, it's not just about the SDG goals. It's about a sustainable government. So everything has its particular place and time, if you understand what I mean. Uh, yes, my question is to the Honourable Minister. Uh, could you please elaborate on uh, the views of government on uh, leakages, please? My name is Joel. Thank you. I think um, in terms of the leakage, the, the facts that were being stated earlier are incorrect. I think that's probably what it is. We, government is fully aware of the leakages that actually uh, are occurring within the industry. But you will find that the level of investment in Fiji, uh, in terms of local investment, comes up to the tune of about $2 billion. These are local investors. So, so there is a little bit of leakage that actually occurs. But all of those investors in Fiji, and you're talking about your own FNPF, you're own talking about their own vision group, you're talking about uh, Liko Liku owner, who's he's sitting here right here, uh, you're talking about um, the Tano group. You're also talking about the small-time operators. So there's a large portion of operators in the tourism industry are local. So you don't have leakages from that perspective. So the percentages of leakages that are being given now, I think they're skewed because maybe the facts might have come from, if I'm correct, I think it's 1992, uh, the actual uh, statistics that were being talked about. And that was a considerable amount of years ago. So the percentage we are aware of, there are measures that are being put in place so that we um, do not have as much leakages as, as, as uh, the current state, but we definitely have a lot better than what it was in 1992. Please, the stats that I gave you in the beginning, the reason, there is a reason behind me giving that, that is to correctly state the facts. The facts that were given after I spoke are facts from 1992. So thank you. Thank you. Over here. Good evening. My name is Krishna Sen, and I um, am Projects Officer at the Fiji Association of the Deaf, and I represent the disability community. I feel um, having policies are very um, important in the um, tourism sector. So um, my question is, do you have any current or future plans and this is directed to anyone in the panel. Do you have any current or future plans on developing accessibility approach for Fijians with disabilities and tourists with disabilities so uh, they can enjoy? Thank you. I will leave the... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll address one part of it uh, in terms of uh, how is the industry how does the industry react uh, to tourists coming into the country who have disabilities? It is part of the industry's requirement. Most accommodation providers will ensure that parts of their hotel, their resorts are um, friendly to any sort of disability. Uh, the staff are taught uh, to treat everybody the same. So it is uh, considered a very friendly destination in terms of uh, that market as well and they can often come in, come in groups for that reason. So it is marketed for that particular target group. Thank you, one from the middle here. Hi, uh, my name is Sam, I'm from Sudelby Youth. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Tourism. As alluded to by Prem Singh in his uh, statement that 40% uh, of tourism money leaves uh, the country and 60% uh, 60 leaves the country and 40% is retained. Um, could or will the government uh, bring about more incentives or provide more investments for locally owned tourism businesses that are not in any target group so that none of the other ones complain, like you said, that 60% uh, is retained instead of 40. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, it's a good question, but um, I think I might have answered that earlier than you asked already. As I said, uh, look, uh, there's a lot going on in Fiji. Fiji, Fiji is at the cusp of, of some some huge things as a country as a whole and that is why I actually said the number uh, on average is now things about two billion dollars worth of 
local investment into the tourist uh, industry alone by just local investors. All the incentives that are being provided are not specifically targeted at overseas investors. You know, um, and uh, anybody and everybody is, in, is incentivized to get into the industry. It's a growing industry. You were sitting, I gave the figures earlier on. So it's not actually um, stopping the local investors from trade. You would see that it, there's confidence in the economy, so people are getting involved. But as I said earlier about the 60-40 ratio, I think that probably is a, f a stat that came from 1992, and that's not quite correct. It has reduced, and we are actually working at it already. FERCA is involved uh, to ensure that we don't have as much leakage as we do. But those figures that we that were given to earlier are definitely incorrect. They are from 1992. Thank you. From this side. Thank you. I'm uh, Anise Porra. I'm a researcher. And uh, I also am uh, from Sadalpa. And I'm a part of the land owning uh, community that owns uh, Nandi International Airport and the surrounding areas. Uh, my interest is uh, looking at airspace as a resource. What is the possibility of uh, empowering the land owning communities close to the Nandi Airport to own the airspace over the, over the communities? and to um, uh, utilize that as a means of uh, uh, earning revenue and also um, passing appropriate legislation that can uh, that will complement that. If this is uh, similar to uh, the concept of uh, Tonga Stat in Tonga. Thank you. Um, definitely not something that we have looked at uh, in terms of the possibility of that. It's, it's, uh, it's not on the radar uh, of government. It is, uh, I'm not sure about what you just said about Tonga, whether Tonga has actually given up its airspace to the, um, to the indigenous people. It is, the, as the law stands, I think um, the law says that if you own a piece of property, you own it from the core of the earth to the heavens above. But the airspace, at the end of the day, with respect to the airport, it, it, it would, um, it, it creates a um, legal minefield so it's not something that's been given a, a lot of thought in Fiji at the moment. But it's, it's something free country. You can raise it if you want to. But uh, it's not something that, be, that has been given any thought by government at the moment. Thank you. Second one from the left side. My name is uh, Rusia Tuwala, a young uh, landowner from Nandi. There's uh, one question and uh, one request. First one is the uh, question. Is any grant for us uh, young landowners want to start up a tourism business in Nandi and uh, also a group? The second one is a uh, request. No, only one question, please. Oh. Uh, can somebody? For young landowners who want to uh, venture into the tourism industry, if you were to see the just recently, Prime Minister actually has given out the grants with respect to development of the land for different things, to prepare it for, for things, and specifically for the tourism industry, you know, whether it's small or big, we start off with our small to medium enterprise uh, grants, etc., to, to start you small. That doesn't necessarily mean that you won't become a big operator. It may be a small venture that you enter into, and we end up marrying you with FDB and the other financial institutions, so you actually can progress. You'll see from the, uh, we're about to set up the small, the National SME Council, which will actually nurture all of these things. So we're not, we don't just look at a grant being given and we leave you within the SME Council and, and, and the, the, the mechanism that's being set up for it. This is the specific purpose for it. And we'll direct you in different places where you can grant grants, whether it be agriculture or tourism, etc. But I suggest if you have a specific venture that you want to get involved in, Please consult the ministry. We will find assistance for you. Uh, my question really is, uh, what is stra strategy in place for micro small business in a traditional setting, example, a village? Uh, just like in Nandi Airport, uh, after the renovation of Nandi Airport, there's a lot of uh, small micro business travel tours. Uh, they've been uh, relocated in which they cannot uh, pay the rent for the Nandi Airport. Thank you. Is your question relative to AFL or to the assistance provided to uh, traditional MSME owners? So uh, it's uh, assistance for those micro small business like traveling tours. 
they've been relocated due to they cannot uh, observe the renting of the uh, renting in the Nadi Airport office. So, what are the strategy there is in place for them to help them assist into the to stay at Nadi Airport? Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, that's, that's a decision that's actually made by Airports Fiji Limited uh, and it's not, uh, it's not got anything to do with my ministry, uh, the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Tourism. In terms of assisting the, the small to medium enterprises, we do assist them in, in all other forms but not specifically with the rental that may have been charged or is being charged at a particular place. That's not the kind of assistance that's that's actually been given to uh, MSMEs. It's actually to, the assistance that's been given is targeted to help you grow. Now, with respect to the issue at, at the airports, Fiji Limited, um, and the space that's, that's there, uh, that's a commercial decision that's been made by Airport Fiji Limited. Um, it's something you'll have to address with them, but if there is, you want to make submissions to them, I'm sure they'll welcome it. Maybe they can make some provision, I don't know, because, but I'm not, directly involved with uh, Airports Fiji Limited, and I don't, uh, it's not uh, under the purview of my ministry. And Madam Speaker, may I comment further on that, yes, please? Sure. Um, the gentleman is speaking of um, the food businesses that catered for the workers at the airport. Uh, and when the airport got expanded, there was no uh, space for these people catering for the workers who worked at the airport. Um, just a small recommendation, you might like to work with the Nandi Town Council on looking at opportunities for that because I know if it's expensive for the workers at the airport to eat there, then there was very much a demand for your service. So you need to take that to the business side of the Nandi, uh, Nandi Town Council. I'm Sri Bhattinan. For my MP deposed in 2000, my concern is what is the development with the Nasori International Airport? because nursery is affected a lot. Thank you. Um, at the moment, I think the, the discussions that are being had uh, with respect to the extension of the runway, we are looking at developing uh, nursery further. Um, AFL and um, I think the, the landowners around the area. It, 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 obviously, that the, um, there is something to do with the soil underneath that needs to cope with all of that and the extension isn't, uh, isn't a band-aid measure, it's for the long term. So it is taking a little bit of time with, it, with respect to that, but I just had a discussion a couple of days ago uh, where that is all being done currently. It's also the, my other hat, the Ministry of Land is also involved in it, uh, but definitely uh, a must for us. Uh, we really want to do that as quickly as possible, but we want to do it well, but it is happening, definitely. Thank you. Is there another one? My question is uh, directed to the Minister. It's uh, for finance and agriculture. So you guys are saying about the, finance, the tourism sector, they cannot provide uh, food for the tourism. So what are you guys uh, doing to empower the agriculture sector in Fiji? Are you investing or...? I could really give you a one-line answer that, that says the agriculture minister is my best friend. But um, definitely, um, you will find, and some of you may know, some of you may not know, but there is a great deal of synergy that exists within all the ministries that involve all the different sectors. And it's not just about the agriculture ministry and uh, the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Tourism and the tourism industry. It's also about the Ministry of Lands. It's also about uh, ITLTB. Uh, in terms of agriculture, it covers a whole lot of sectors. There is a definite definite uh, program that we're looking at to put in place more and more of our locally grown fruit and vegetables. You know, we have the sweetest pineapple in the world. We have the sweetest papaya in the world. We have the sweetest banana in the world. We have the next thing off our trend will be that we probably have the best organic food in the world because we are organic by nature. These things are being done in conjunction with the Ministry of Agriculture. The Minister of Agriculture is working very hard to ensure that he gets in as many products uh, our, that are locally grown into the tourism industry, into the hotels. The GPH will tell you themselves 
that every time the Minister of Agriculture turns up here, looks at the menu to find out exactly what's here from here and what's, what's, uh, what's from overseas. And pretty much everybody's now getting on board. So it is something that is a vision for government to ensure that all our agricultural products are part and parcel of the tourism uh, menu. As mentioned earlier, um, the government is intending to um, generate 2.21 billion by 2021. How do you intend to do that? Uh, I'm interested to, to know. And, uh, um, no, there's one question only. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, first, I must say that uh, you must remember that any development that government does or any goals that it sets, it has to be done in a sustainable fashion. We have, um, and it's a good question, if you would have seen before, you know, everybody says, oh, why aren't we bringing a million tourists? I keep getting asked the same question and I keep getting, uh, uh, giving the same answer. For government, it is the yield that we fetch out of tourism. And so far we have done extremely well. And the trajectory that we are on at the moment, we should reach that figure barring any cyclones and disasters, etc. But even with the cyclone that came last time, we got back on a good footing. We have, because we have a fairly good relationship with all the industry stakeholders, Fiji Airways stepped in, all the industry, uh, industry players stepped in to ensure that the industry didn't suffer. This is Fiji's biggest industry. But in terms of our development to getting to that stage, it is being done by targeting that uh, higher spending tourists. You know, uh, it's not, as I say, it's not about the number of people that you begin. If, if, I, if we suddenly decided to open the skies, our infrastructure would collapse. And we don't want that. That has happened in Palau. So it has to be done in a sustainable fashion. Bearing in mind our commitments to the environment, bearing in mind our commitments to our people and all the other things that we have to take in place. So it is not a target that's just been pulled out of thin air and said, we want to do this. It is the target that has been set bearing in mind all the uh, doing things in a sustainable fashion, but by getting into the yield markets rather than the number of people. Thank you. From this side, yes. Uh, my name is Kuse Jiwandi, and um, I'd like to ask a question to the Honorable Minister. Um, what is the government doing about pollution in Fiji? <laughs> Thank you. I think that's our next Prime Minister. <laughs> um, thank you, my friend, for that question. We are doing a lot. You would have seen, um, I think, one of the main things that we're actually doing, like one example I can use is, it's about the use of fossil fuels. We are, a government is on a, 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 a really trying to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that we use in terms of the pollution in the environment. Uh, you would have seen from the Ministry of Health, the uh, Ministry of Employment has actually been in quite involved in, in getting awareness around the place to, to, for less pollution around the place. You know, the plastics that are being used, the taxes that have been put on, so government is adamant that we're actually going to reduce the pollution in the skies, in the air. We still are quite lucky in com uh, compared to the rest of the world. If you go around, um, we, we do wake up and see clear blue skies unlike a lot of other nations, and we need to ensure that we protect it. And government also, as I said, has, um, we, it's, it's like an exercise the general public need to know. It's not just about government doing it. It's also about the school kids. It's all about awareness. It's about everybody putting in their 10 cents worth to ensure that we are a pollution-free country. But in terms of awareness, we are doing a lot in terms of what we have to do with reducing reduction of fossil fuels, alternative energy being used, industry, uh, tourism industry respectively, uh, specifically, even operators when they do develop their resource and they're now using renewable energy. You know, one of the things also that everybody should know, there is a great interest now in Fiji uh, for the development of tourist, tourist, uh, tourism places that leave a zero carbon footprint. So Fiji is a destination uh, that people are looking at for that, that kind of stuff because we're still clean in comparison to other places. But yes, definitely government is very, very uh, keen on ensuring that we are pollution free with all those different programs. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm uh, Simi. I'm from the private sector. 
Um, my question is on casino. Um, the AG has mentioned in his budget address about uh, casino, <coughs> casino license being issued to FNPF. And um, I saw expression of interest already in the newspaper by FNPF for potential partnership. Uh, my question is, um, is Momi ready for a casino, considering the, the infrastructure? Or is it best that we leave it for Denra with the current you know, developments that's already there? Infrastructure is ready. That's my question. Uh, it's directed to the panel. Uh, Socioeconomic effects and uh, effects of casino, the good and the bad. I leave it to the panel. In terms of whether Momi is ready or not and whether the alternative destination is dinner out to do that, uh, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's obviously, the EOI, as you say, has gone out and it, it'll take a bit of time that, uh, it, it, for that to actually happen. Um, I guess it's just thinking like a layperson, it's just the putting up a building and the machines that need to go in, infrastructure that needs to go in, the laws that need to be put in place. If you put all of that together, it does take a bit of time. So it's not actually about which location it's put on. The location doesn't really affect the license. Uh, of course, in terms of, it has to be near a tourism destination. That, of course, yes, but whether it's impact in, uh, in terms of the rest of the society, those are the things that the law will take place, uh, law will take care of. Um, FNPF has a vision and a plan to do it, but whether it's Momi or Denarau, not really uh, something that, that should affect either. Um, my name is Sion Thomas, and um, I, I just have a question in general. Uh, I was listening to the speakers earlier, and I've heard uh, from Fantasia about how tourism, for it to be uh, pros for, for the nation as a whole to prosper, uh, it needs a nationwide effort, and uh, there's also some uh, references to intersect uh, leakages and how... Because I believe in that philosophy that um, it's not just about tourism market uh, trying to drive the economy into prosperity. I believe in uh, a few... I believe in the nation as a whole working together. That's, the, that's how we will get sustainable prosperity. So my question is to the Min Honorable Minister of Tourism. If he can share a bit on uh, his plans uh, in terms of nationwide events that can prosper multiple sectors, such as the um, the uh, the game, the rugby game, the super rugby, because it brings in people, it gains attention, and a lot of other people gain from Thank other you. businesses. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. With respect to what's happening, we it's not just one sector that uh, we are relying on. You know, in terms of tourism, if I gather right, you're asking uh, in terms of development, what different sectors or are, is there a sectoral engagement with everything? Is that correct? Um, my question is regarding your ministry. Do you have uh, plans like a uh, nationwide uh, plan for people yes. by the Ministry of Tourism that you would that you could share with us so that you can be more aware? Of? Every, every year we have a uh, tourism forum uh, where everybody comes in and gives their ideas and we look at it, you know, and we do have um, the, our, the, our tourism development plan that should be out shortly. Um, um, that has been an engagement with the industry. That was the platform for doing it. But we do have a particular forum everywhere, so anybody and everybody, they come and give their views on how we should be doing things. But in terms of what you're asking, is there specific activities around the place uh, that the tourism ministry does to engage with uh, the different sectors to do different things? If I could just point out, uh, with respect to, um, let's say, uh, like what we're actually talking about, about sustainable development goals, let's say for argument's sake, I went to actually open a, a, a hotel and what we do at the same time is we engage with the public, we engage with the stakeholders, we engage with the school children to bring them in to plant mangroves, which we have done just recently. So that's the kind of stuff that the ministry goes out and does and also keeps in line with our SDGs. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. As the time is catching up on us, we'll have just that one more last question. It is from the gentleman behind there. Uh, my name is Krishan Vilash. Uh, we are the uh, exhaust manufacturers, program of our manufacturing company limited. We're trying to keep the environment very clean and quiet. And uh, I'm very surprised to see the amount of motor vehicles. I'm sure everybody will, will uh, uh, be with me saying that the amount of motor vehicles on Fiji roads are, uh, we haven't got any place for the cars to drive or park or go. And if you want to come from Samabula to Suva, it takes about an hour. But what are we doing about this? I know the road has been built and it will take time. And the two bridges, Bakumanga and uh, Suva, this is really big obstruction to the traffic. And I think it's very timely that the tourism industry is doing this because there is a big prosperity and prospect for tourism industry in Fiji because it has become number one economy and financial and, and foreign health. Thank you. Um, for one, you can't stop people from buying cars. They have a lot of money, they can buy cars. But at the end of the day, I think the influx of vehicles you're actually talking about is due to the fact that the hybrid vehicles were given a duty-free status for quite a while. So those hybrid vehicles coming in are really, uh, it's just not about the vehicles coming in. They're a reduction on the pollution that we put into the environment. They're not using gas. They're hybrid vehicles. And with respect to the number of vehicles on the road, you would have seen that government is investing a hell of a lot of money in, in, in the infrastructure to get it right. And you know, and you can't stop the consumer from buying a vehicle. You can't stop the consumer because he earns more money, which most people do now, to actually enjoy the benefits of his labor. Um, in, and uh, all the policies with respect to government in terms of pollution, like I said earlier, we are addressing all of those. but. With respect to the extra vehicles, we all face it every day. You'll see that there are a lot of them are, are, are hybrid vehicles. So there's less of pollution on the environment, less the use of fossil fuels. But your, your worries about what, what are we going to do, um, it was open for a little while. Now it's actually um, a reduced duty that actually they, that they have to pay. But we're encouraging more and more people to ride a motorcycle or buy a hybrid vehicle, so there's lesser, lesser impact on the environment. Thank you, Honourable Ministers, Members of Parliament, Excellencies. I, in closing, I would like to thank each of the panelists for participating to, in the debate today and all of you for your questions and taking interest in this important issue. In particular, I would like to thank those viewers that are joining us on the, uh, through live stream. And I would like to again to thank the UNDP and our sponsors, the European Union and the governments of Japan, Australia and New Zealand for their support of the speaker's debate. Finally, a big thank you to the Parliament Secretariat staff who have worked so hard to make today's event a success that has been. We will be announcing upon the subject and the date for the next speaker's debate and that will not be too far away. And I'd like to thank you very much indeed. Please uh, join us with a refreshment and have a restful evening. Thank you.